That's fine. But okay, it just helps yeah. you to see it. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's fine. fine. I grew up in Kilmarnock, which was then a thriving industrial township in the west of Scotland. But throughout my boyhood, I had access to farms and farmlands which had been owned, and before that tenanted, by relatives on my father's side, back to Robert Burns' day. Many of my early poems, I suppose, eulogised and elegised a way of life which now itself seems centuries ago. Todd. My father's white uncle became arthritic and testamental in lyrical stages. He held cardinal sin was misuse of horses, then any game won on the Sabbath. But Clydesdale to him was not bells and sugar or declension from paddock, but primal extension of rock and soil. Thundered nail turned to sacred bolt, and each night in the stable he would slaver and slave at cracked hooves, or else save bowls of porridge for just the right beast. I remember I lied to him once about oats. Then I felt the brand of his loving tongue, the belt of his own horsey breath. But he died when the mechanised tractor came to pass. Now I think of him neighing to some saint in a simple heaven, or, beyond complaint, leaning across a fence and munching grass. One incident or image from those days remains as startling in my mind's eye as it was at the time, probably because of its preservation in a little poem called Ferret. More vicious than stoat or weasel, because caged, kept hungry, the ferrets were let out only for the kill, an alternative to sulphur and nets. Once one, badly mauled, hid behind a treacle barrel in the shed. Throwing me back, Matthew slid the door shut. From outside the window I watched. He stood holding an axe with no gloves. Then it sprang, and his sleeves were drenched in blood where the teeth had sunk. I hear its high-pitched squeal, the clamp of its neat steel jaws. And I remember how the axe flashed, severing the ferret's head, and how its body kept battering the barrels long after it was dead. It's difficult to travel for long through the Scottish Highlands without being made very aware of land, townships, depopulated at the time of the Highland Clearances, driving through Sutherland. Here too the crofts were burned to the ground, families stripped and driven like cattle to the shore. You can still hear the cursing, the women shrieking. The Duke and his lady sipped port and wax in their ears. Thatch blazed, thistles were torn up by the root. There are men in Parliament today who could be doing more. With these thoughts in mind, we drive from Overskeg to Lairg through a night as blue as steel. Leaving Loch Shin behind, we find facing us an even colder Firth and a new moon rising delicately over a stubble field. The next poem contains the phrase, an ear to the ground, not as an epigraph, but within the body of the poem. This is, and, and the tone of my own piece, probably as well, is taken from a poem by Louis MacNeese, Tremors. We took turns at laying an ear on the rail, so that we could tell by the vibrations when a train was coming. Then we'd flatten ourselves to the banks, scorched vetch and hedge parsley, while the iron flanks rushed past, sending sparks flying. 
It is more and more a question of living with an ear to the ground. The tremors, when they come, are that much greater for ourselves and others. Nor is it any longer a game, but a matter of survival. Each explosion part of a procession. There can be no stopping. Though the end is known, there is nothing for it but to keep listening. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, poet, essayist, philosopher, genius, was also, poor chap, a nightmare-ridden, drug-addicted melancholic who, when he went skating, he describes this in a letter, I think, to Dorothy Wordsworth, when he went skating, couldn't tear his eyes from the water in front of his feet for fear he fell through. Not like the iconic image of the Reverend Robert Walker skating on Duddingston Loch. In, I think, what's known as the Mercury position, the acme of moral equipoise. Or was he? Under the ice. Like Coleridge, I waltz on ice and watch my shadow on the water below, knowing that if the ice were not there, I'd drown, half willing it. In my cord jacket and neat cravat, I keep returning to the one spot. I long to cut a perfect circle out. But something in me rejects the notion. The arc is never complete. My figures of eight almost not quite meet. Was Rayburn's skating parson a man of God, poised impeccably on the brink, or his bland stare no more than a decorous front? If I could keep my cool like that, gazing straight ahead, not at my feet, giving no sign of knowing how deep the water, how thin the ice. Behind that, the other question, whether the real you pirouettes in space or beckons from under the ice for me to come through. Ice imagery, which has clearly remained dormant for some considerable time, is used to very different effect in visiting hour. In the pond of our new garden were five orange stains under inches of ice. Weeks since anyone had been there, already by far the most severe winter for years. You broke the ice with a hammer. I watched the goldfish appear, blunt-nosed and delicately clear. Since then, so much has taken place to distance us from what we were, that it should have come to this. Unable to hide the horror in my eyes, I stand helpless by your bedside and can do no more than wish it were simply a matter of smashing the ice and giving you air. My favourite translation of Carpe Diem, Horace's Carpe Diem, would be Live every hour to the full, treasure every moment to the full. Carpe Diem. From my study window, I see you below in the garden. A hand here pruning, or leaning across to snip a wayward shoot, a daub of powder blue in a profusion of green. Then next moment, you're no longer there, only to reappear, this time perfectly framed in dappling sunlight, with an armful of ivy you've trimmed, topped by hyacinth blooms, fragrant survivors of last night's frost. And my heart misses a beat at love for you, knowing a time will come when you're no longer there, nor I here to watch you on a day of such simplicity. Meantime, let us make sure we clasp each shared moment in cupped hands, like water we dare not spill. Many years ago, 
having lost my wife on our first visit to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, she goes around art galleries much more slowly than I do, I backtracked to see if I could find her and eventually saw her standing, gazing at Bonnard's The Breakfast Room. And when I appeared at her shoulder, she said, I could live with that. So I, without her knowing, bought a poster, brought it home, and since then it has been framed in our flat. Until recently, after a considerable time lapse, recently I saw, or imagined I saw in it for the first time, a little peripheral female figure on the left-hand side of the canvas. That sparked off a realisation that a poem was bubbling up. It was a short poem addressed to the painting. A few nights later, unpremeditated, a second section, her response, materialised. And after a slightly longer period, Bonnard himself put his oar in. Subsequently, I did some reading and discovered that without being fully able to understand or take on board the, the whole principle of, of long and short light waves, I got the impression that his use in many of his other paintings, particularly of oranges and yellows, meant that these colours were particularly visible during the day in bright light, and that the mauves, the violets in the periphery of this painting come into their own in the evening twilight. And given his own statement that he tended to put important figures at the periphery of his paintings, I like to think that my belated discovery of her tallied with what his intention had been as an artist whose work I love. The paintings on the wall, the poem is in, as I say, three short sections in three voices. The Breakfast Room. That poster has been on my wall for years. The other night, a woman appeared in it, a nondescript figure, more a housekeeper than the wife whom the bohemian in him painted in her bathtub over and over down the decades. Holding a cup, the other arm slack, she merges with the curtain's muted tones, a balustrade, shady garden beyond. Waif-like, half her body out with the frame, she seems almost spectral, as if dissolving, or part of a transformation scene. I'd gladly join her. Brioche and baguettes to share, tea in the pot, a chair easily drawn up. But unlikely, given her forlorn stare. Not once has there been the prelude to an invitation or the least indication she has noticed me. Two. Whether the artist's wife or his chatelaine, why in heaven's name would I invite you in? You scarcely endear yourself by dismissing me as some drab, that or a moody phantom. While I make no claim to beauty, a little sensitivity wouldn't come amiss can be hard enough dispelling the notions of those who ogle my husband's nude studies on me. As to not noticing you, quite the reverse, I'm far too aware of your presence, my room lit at all hours while you pursue your obsession, loud music putting an end, albeit temporarily, to my tranquillity. But between marginality and impermanence, lies a fine distinction. Whichever of us you believe to be the fiction, I'll look out long after you've stopped looking in. And three, you find my mat unobtrusive. For a spell she was so self-effacing, whenever I wanted to paint her, she would hide behind the curtains. In one portrait, not dissimilar to this, she virtually disappears. Here, simultaneously concealed and revealed, she blends in perfectly. Small compensation for what she has undergone, illness held in abeyance by immersion in water, 
Hence my depictions of her as Venus emerging, the light casting a spell on her skin, as it was when I first met her. A vision of young love preserved, my palette imbues her with the blue violet of memory. No need to choose between smelling the scent and plucking the flower. Painting her has been like bottling a rare spirit. And now, if you'll excuse me, I have her bath to run.